Okay, um, so we're going to look at kind of five things to do with um, method learning today. Some of it might be a bit um, stretchy and a bit challenging, uh, and that's fine. Other things, we'll be looking at some uh, practical tips uh, and, and things with different types of methods. Some of the methods that I'm going to use as illustrations might be um, beyond what you're aiming to learn at the moment, or it might be um, something that you already know really well. Uh, they're just being used really for illustrative purposes, so it's not necessarily to say that you're, you know, you should be learning uh, a particular method that I'm showing you. They're all really just to illustrate different principles. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about what a blue line is and why it's a useful thing. Uh, we're going to think about what's uh, ways of dividing up the learning that you do when you're learning a method. So looking at um, play spells, looking at different chunks of, uh, of work and how we can uh, divide up the learning. Uh, and then we'll look at some ways that you can take that learning time at home and use it uh, to help you with um, actually ringing things in the tower. So looking for helpful uh, signs, um, thinking about a bit about method structure, uh, we'll talk briefly about place notation and grids as well. So a range of different things, some of which are quite hard, don't worry if anything uh, leaves you befuddled, it's a good time I think to be uh, stretching our brains, but hopefully it'll mostly be pretty accessible. Um, so we'll start with uh, looking at um, plain bob and if I can move the slide on, let's see. Being a bit slow. There we go. Okay. Um, so I thought we'd start just looking at something uh, that may be familiar, might not be, um, talking a bit about plain bob doubles. Now, um, one of the things that people often use for learning plain bob doubles is a thing called the circle of work, which I've put in the diagram on the on the right of the slide, uh, which includes various bits of information, but focuses um, pretty much on um, dodging and on making places. So seconds uh, around here, seconds, three, four down, four blows behind, three, four up. Um, what that's doing is it's actually uh, giving you, it's focusing rather on the, uh, the bits where you're doing something different to plane hunting. And the bits where you're plane hunting are kind of assumed in that circle of work for Bob Doubles. Um, and that's kind of the first tip in terms of method learning is to try to think about it as you're trying to learn the bits where you have to, uh, in a way, do something uh, different, do a bit of work. And then things like saying hunt up to the back is actually quite a, a simple and brief way of learning something which takes uh, a, a little while and takes up quite a, quite a large chunk of most methods, particularly in plain bob most of the time you're plain hunting and if you can think well i'm just hunting down to the back hunting up to the back hunting down to the front um rather than going through okay fourth place third place second place lead lead etc you can already start to reduce the amount of learning that you're having to do uh, if that makes sense so the circle of work reduces the learning that you do for bob doubles uh, and if you can look at a blue line and think okay certain sections of this are just I'm just plain hunting, uh, that's another way of reducing the learning time that has to go into learning a method. Um, I thought it would be helpful to spend a bit of time looking at um, a blue line in detail and thinking about what all the different bits of information that that blue line is trying to give you actually mean. Um, so in most um, printed versions of methods, you tend to have a, uh, a line that shows the treble's path, and the treble is doing a regular thing for each lead. It might be treble bobbing up to the back and down to the front in methods like Kent or Cambridge Minor, uh, or it might be plain hunting up to the back and down to the front in methods like plain bob, um, St. Clements, that sort of thing. Um, in this case, in this one of plain bob minor, the treble's hunting up to the back and down to the front and leading, and that is one lead of a method. Uh, and the treble's shown in a, with a red line. Um, then in most blue lines uh, that you'd see, um, either the second or the tenor, and there's a reason for this that we'll talk about in a moment, either the second or the tenor is shown with a blue line, which follows the path of one of the, one of the working bells, so I say usually two or, or the tenor. Um, 
if you've just joined, if you could make sure your microphone's on mute, that'd be really helpful. Um, the other bits of information that are often presented on a blue line, you will often see in a circle next to uh, each lead end when the treble is leading, uh, you might see a number. Um, those are what's called play spells, and we'll talk a bit more about those and what they're for in a, in a moment. Um, you sometimes have a string of crosses and numbers down the side as well, uh, and that's what's called place notation. A bit later in the session, we'll talk about what place notation is. Um, the, in terms of how it represents what you're actually doing in, in the ringing chamber when you're ringing, um, if we look at this section here, this middle lead uh, here, we can see this is where the six starts in plain Bob minor. The blue line going in this direction shows it hunting down to the front. The blue line being here as the first bell shows that it's leading. This blue line going in this direction shows it hunting up. And this little step back into fifth place shows a dodge, in this case, dodging five, six up. So that's what a blue line is showing you. Lines going that way um, show a bell hunting down. Lines going this way show a bell hunting up. And this, as one example, is a dodge. Um, so that's kind of what you get when you print out a blue line or when you look in a diagrams book or something like that. This is what, you're, what, the, what the information is, is kind of giving you. Um, I'd like to talk now a bit about play spells and why they're a useful thing. And there are kind of four big reasons why play spells are a helpful thing uh, to be using in your learning and in your ringing. Um, the first one really is that it's showing you where at the start of a plain course of any given method, where each bell would start that method. So uh, in those, you know, those situations where you're sort of uh, asked to ring something, you think, oh, well, where does that bell, where does that bell start in that particular method? That's what play spells are there to, to tell you. So for example, the four, if you were ringing the four to a plain course of plain Bob minor, you'd start by hunting down to the front, leading, hunting up to the back, lying behind, and then dodging five, six down. Uh, if you were starting on the two, you'd start by leading, hunting to the back, hunting down, dodging three, four down, that sort of thing. So the first reason play spells are helpful is that they show you where to start in any given uh, method. The second reason is that they help you to break down the method into more manageable chunks, um, so that when you're learning it, you can learn it Sort of play spell at a time uh, and reduce the amount of learning you have to do. That's going to be particularly useful at the next example we're going to look at. Um, uh, the third reason is if you want to ring spliced, so putting different methods together in the same piece of ringing, uh, knowing play spells is kind of essential for knowing where you're going to start if you're switching from one method to another. Um, and the fourth reason is it's kind of like a, a kind of common language uh, of ringing, that um, if somebody is going wrong, they can often be helped out by saying your this play spell of the method, um, and that can help them to get back on track. If we have a look at Cambridge Minor, we can start to see why dividing the learning into chunks is quite useful. This method's obviously quite a bit more complex than the uh, plain Bob minor we saw in the previous example. There's a lot more going on. And so dividing the learning into manageable sections um, is a useful way of managing that, that learning and being able to think, okay, so I've, I've learned, for example, seconds play spell, um, and you've tested yourself on that and gone over it, and then you can go through learning the other play spells uh, after that. Um, so that's kind of why play spells and dividing the learning up into chunks is a useful technique. So we've looked at what a blue line is and why play spells are helpful. Um, now I've talked about lots of different things, lead ends, play spells, um, hunting, that sort of thing, dodges and so on. Um, I just want to talk a bit about ringing terminology um, and why it's useful. Um, we've probably all been in that, that sort of situation in a tower at a practice night uh, where some uh, very expert ringer is asked, oh, could you ring this, this method? Uh, and they say, oh, well, I could have a look at it. 
and then they take a quick glance at the blue line uh, for say 10 seconds, put it down, say yes, that's fine, and then they bring it thoughtlessly. Very frustrating thing for, for the rest of us to witness perhaps. Um, but I'll let you in for a, to a secret to that, which is that probably that ringer hasn't actually learnt the entirety of the blue line. What they've probably done is seen lots of familiar chunks of work that they already know from other methods and simply put it together, simply put it together uh, into a new method. They, so, and that's quite clever and it takes a lot of expertise, but it's not quite the same as learning a, a blue line in 10 seconds. It's probably not what they've done. So let's have a look at how that ringer, that hypothetical ringer might have managed to uh, learn a method in a, in a very short period of time. Um, ringing's kind of made up of lots of different ingredients. Methods are made up of lots of ingredients. And if we can get the hang of this terminology, it's quite a helpful way of shortening the amount of learning we're doing. I've already said how saying, uh, so I'm hunting for a section of time, can be quite a useful way of uh, taking quite a big chunk of a method and just describing it in a few words, um, hunting to the back, hunting down to the front, etc. Uh, similarly, if you have uh, a dodge or a double dodge or even a triple dodge or a four or five pull dodge, some methods have uh, 11 pull dodges in them, um, which are hard to count, but um, it can take a, you know, a long chunk of a lead and actually uh, reduce it to uh, you know two or three words that so you're describing it as a triple dodge. There are even longer chunks of work such as uh, the front work in Kent, Kent Minor or Major or, or Royal which is made up of leading and making seconds repeatedly um, so you can have things like Kent front work or Kent places. The Cambridge front work takes half of a lead of, of Cambridge Minor. Um, Cambridge places um, which is a dodge and then a place, a place, another dodge, and so on. Um, again, in Cambridge Minor, that describes actually the, the work of half of a lead of, of the method. The Cambridge back work is the entirety of the work that thirds place felt us. And so uh, that ringer who's able to say, oh yes, I can ring that, that's fine, uh, might have seen that the method is uh, partly made up of Cambridge. So there were some Cambridge places, there's some Cambridge back work, uh, they might have seen some other familiar elements, they might have seen some triple dodging somewhere, and they're putting those ingredients together uh, into a sort of picture in their mind that allows them to ring, ring that method. Um, it's worth also at this point, just going back to the Cambridge Minor diagram, to talk briefly about method symmetry. The methods have, uh, methods like uh, Cambridge Minor, so even bell methods, minor, major, royal, and so on, um, have two points of symmetry in them, where if you uh, put a, a mirror or, or drew, a, drew a line, um, you would get um, the method that you've run up to that point, you would then have it sort of reflected as it were. So if we look at thirds place bell in Cambridge Minor, this central lead here, uh, this point where it makes a place, makes fifths underneath the treble, uh, we've seen here we've got a double dodge, lie behind, dodge, and then make fifths. And then the symmetry part comes in, we've got a dodge, which mirrors the, the dodge that's just been done before the fifths, then lying behind mirrors that part, then a double dodge mirrors this part, and down to three, four. Um, the other point of symmetry is when the treble's leading in, in even bell methods. Uh, in Cambridge, a bell makes seconds at that point, and we can see here how this front work, dodge, lead, dodge, seconds, lead, dodge, make seconds, is mirrored over here with a dodge, lead, seconds, dodge, lead, and dodge. And so um, particularly for even bell ringing, uh, that ringer who's able to learn a method really quickly might also be thinking about the symmetry and be sort of flipping it in their head uh, as part of the learning. Now, I don't tend to like ringing like that because I think it makes me go wrong, but um, in terms of learning, it's quite a useful learning tool to go, okay, so I've learned seconds place bell, uh, and that's the sort of opposite of fifths place bell in Cambridge Minor. I've learned sixths place bell, and then I can see that being mirrored in the work of fourths place bell, which is sort of doing sixth place bell backwards, as it were. So looking at symmetry is another way of reducing the learning time uh, that you're having to do, thinking about 
uh, chunking the method up into familiar sections and thinking about uh, ways in which you can use symmetry to help your uh, learning. So the end product as a result of that is a sort of um, either a visual picture in that ringer's head uh, or a kind of uh, almost spoken description in their mind of what that method involves and what the work of that method following that blue line uh, involves. And at that point, I'd just like to take a little detour into the world of educational and sports psychology, which doesn't sound as though it should fit with this, but there were three lessons uh, from educational psychology and from sports psychology I'd like to uh, share with you uh, from my day job as a history teacher. Um, the first one is a thing called dual coding. All of this will be in the pack that I'm going to send to you afterwards, so don't worry if you're desperately trying to scribble this down. But the first one is dual coding. Uh, which basically says that, um, for, well, students revising for exams, was it what this was thought of for, but it applies equally well to method learning. If you have um, more than one way of thinking about rehearsing, revising, or presenting the information that you've got, that makes it more solid in your memory. So if, for example, you can draw out the line, but also perhaps describe the line to somebody, uh, so you're speaking it and you're drawing it um, or doing other ways of presenting that information like a circle of work uh, that helps to embed it in your long term memory. The second lesson is something called retrieval practice, which basically says that the more you practice, it's kind of common sense, really, the more you practice retrieving information, the stronger it becomes in your long term memory. If we think about those things in ringing that uh, we can do sort of automatically, that could be a range of things like we might now be thinking we can handle a bell automatically, or we can sort of ring call changes without thinking about it too much, perhaps, or plain hunt, or whichever method it is. Uh, there are certain things we can kind of do automatically, and that's as a result of having to do it repeatedly and to recall what that uh, particular skill involves. So retrieval practice, practicing going over methods, revising them, rehearsing them in your head, drawing out the line, the more you practice doing that, the stronger the, the memory gets it's about beating a thing that uh, teachers call the forgetting curve, where if you don't think about something for a while, you kind of forget it. Um, the other part of that retrieval practice that lots of uh, educational psychologists now say is that making mistakes and getting things wrong is a, an important part of the learning process. So the next time you uh, miss a dodge at a practice night and the tower captain shouts at you, you can simply say to them, ah, but making mistakes is an important part of the learning process. Uh, educational psychologists say so, um, if you're feeling brave. Um, and the third lesson, which is from sports psychology and is to do with world-class athletes, is around uh, something called visualization which is about visualizing what that final performance will look like, thinking again, thinking it through in your head, um, but perhaps with a bit more detail about, okay, so I might be, if I'm hunting up, I'm just pulling a little bit harder to get able to go up, I'm uh, holding up that hand stroke, going up into seconds place, visualizing what that final performance in the tower will look like is another uh, way of helping you to, re, uh, to sort of really know a method really well. Uh, so those are my three little um, psychology detours on method learning. Okay, um, we're now going to think a bit about uh, other ways of approaching learning a method. And this is about other things that you might notice in the course of learning a method that can help you with uh, ringing it um, when, when you come to ring it. Um, the first couple of things I wanted to talk a bit, a bit about are about using the treble as an anchor for your ringing. Um, in these two examples, I've got plain Bob Major and Grand Sir Triples on the slide. Um, there is a very simple treble-based rule for how the method works, which is effectively for plain Bob, and this is true for plain Bob minor, uh, doubles, triples, maximus, however many bells you want to ring plain Bob on. The simple rule for plain Bob is that everybody rings plain Hunt um, all of the time except for when the treble leads. And when the treble leads, a bell makes seconds, and all the bells above seconds place do a dodge. And so in your learning time at, at, at home, if you're looking at playing Bob, 
uh, one of the things you can learn to help you when you're ringing it is to think, okay, so I've got to ring plane hunt until the treble leaves, uh, and then there's a dodge. That wouldn't necessarily replace your knowledge of the blue line or of the circle of work, but it can supplement it. And if you get a bit stuck when you're ringing the method, um, you can think, okay, so I'm passing the treble here, it's on its way down, or you can listen out for it. That's hard, but um, listen out for the treble uh, and then try to dodge then, that sort of thing. Um, with Granza triples, it's a very similar rule. There are two hunt bells, or Granza doubles, or Granza whatever on any number of bells. Uh, there are two hunt bells uh, in a plane course. It's the one and the two is the other hunt bell. Um, and when the treble has led at backstroke, slightly different to plane bob, treble leads at backstroke, when it comes off the lead into seconds place, but place at handstroke, a bell makes thirds, and the bells above that thirds do a dodge. So this is sort of structural stuff about the method, but also based on listening to where the treble is. Now, that's not necessarily to say that next time you're, you're ringing in a tower, you'll be immediately picking up where the treble is all the time, but it's worth spending some time if you're sitting out at a practice night, practicing listening for where the treble is, uh, looking for when the treble's leading, watching the treble a bit, but also watching other bells and trying to work out what they need to do by where the treble is. So this is a useful skill that you can practice while sitting out at practice nights, as well as when you're actually ringing. Um, another way in which the treble can be very useful is in reducing the amount of blue line that you have to spend time learning. Um, lots of methods, this is particularly the case with um, minor ringing, surprise, delight, and treble bob minor ringing, uh, but it's also the case with uh, surprise major, lots of surprise major methods and methods on higher numbers as well, uh, is that methods often share a common work when bells are either above or below the treble. Um, like I've said before, this isn't necessarily to say that you'll be immediately going and learning Cambridge and Yorkshire surprise major, but I just want to illustrate this point. Um, if we look at seconds place bell in Yorkshire surprise major, so the diagram on the left, uh, it's doing some work here. We can see that the blue line is lower in the change than the red line. They are below the treble. Um, at this point here that the mouse is just pointing to, the two passes the treble in six, seven. And then the bits of work that it does here, just to, just circling that now, a double dodge, lie behind, a single dodge, and then dodge five, six down. Okay. If we move over to the diagram on the right of Cambridge Surprise Major, um, here we have the section where seconds place bells below the treble. It's doing something different to what it was doing in Yorkshire Surprise Major. But here, when it passes the treble in 6-7, uh, we've got a double dodge lying behind a single dodge and 5-6 down. Cambridge Major and Yorkshire Major share the same work when bells are above the treble. Um, if you just mute your microphone, that'd be helpful. Um, share the same work above the treble, where um, they're ringing what we'd call. If you just mute your microphone, that'd be really helpful. Thank you. I like the. I like a. I'm, I'm coming away because I don't want to get caught on that WhatsApp thing. But no. Oh, good. She's, so does it fit her? Uh, sorry, everyone. I'm just going to um, deal with that. All right. Okay. Okay, um, so they share what's called um, the same work um, above the treble, Cambridge major above the treble, uh, and you can therefore reduce the learning time that you're spending learning surprise minor, surprise major methods by thinking about then sharing a common work when, when bells are in certain places in, in the method. In um, a, a much simpler example uh, would be plain bob minor, the work when you're above the treble in play bob minor is the same in methods such as um, double bob or St. Clement's college bob minor, um, that, that you're doing the same work above the treble in those methods. Uh, it also applies with, say, Cambridge minor uh, and Ipswich surprise minor, for example. So you can reduce your learning time by looking for common features, as we saw in the ringing terminology section, and you can reduce the learning time by looking for um, methods where they share a similar work above or below the treble. Okay. Um, 
and there are treble based rules for all sorts of different methods um, that you can that you can sort of learn and look at and ask people about and ask people for hints and tips that involve looking at where the treble is um, okay this leads on quite nicely to a bit of a discussion about method structure which again as i've said some sections of this are quite stretchy and complicated um, but hopefully this will be a, a relatively accessible guide to method structure um, if i can move the slide on let's see okay um right so i'm going to try to explain with the 10 minutes that we've got left um two things about method structure i mentioned at the start when we were looking at the blue line for bob minor uh, this string of numbers down the side of a a, um, a blue line and um, that's called place notation now what place notation basically is it's a way of describing what happens in the method and it used to be a very important part of ringing because when um, in the days before the internet when ringers were arranging peels of different methods the way they would um, for a new method the way they would communicate that with each other would be by uh, sending in the post, for example, the place notation for the method. Uh, this, as I understand it, that was before my time, led to various comical situations where somebody would read the place notation out over the phone, somebody would write down the place notation incorrectly, write out the wrong method and then turn up and be unable to ring uh, properly in the peel or quarter peel attempt. Um, but place notation is a way of describing what happens in the method. Um, and then a grid is a way of showing that method structure in a more visual form um, and it's basically a collection of all of the blue lines that's this uh, a, the grid is on the right of the slide as you're looking at it a collection of all of the blue lines put together um, so for two three four five and six in this example with kent treble bob minor um, what place notation basically does is, and we can see it on here, a cross means that all the bells in one, two, three, four, and five, six for minor change places with the bell next to them. So one and two, the bells in one and two swap. In three and four, they swap. In five and six, they swap. Um, then when there's a place, uh, that's described by the number of the place. So three and four means there are places made in thirds and fourths, for example. Um, and methods are usually made up of a, a place and then a cross and then a place generally um, you can't have more than one cross because that brings you back into where you were before um, it'd be like doing a, a dodge and just going straight back into rounds for example um, so if we look at the grid we can see how place notation sort of translates into method structure um, cross we might be able to see i've just circled here um, these bells in one two three four and five six are crossing um they're swapping places uh where we've got one and six we hopefully can see a bell leading and a bell lying behind uh, and where we've got one and two we can hopefully see a bell leading a bell making seconds that causes these bells here to do a, a dodge and kent can be uh, because there's a lot of this six one six cross one two cross one six cross one two cross one six in the place notation because of that the structure is actually quite um, easy to get a handle on um, bells change places a bell leads the bell doing this long front work here uh, in the middle of the diagram on the left makes seconds over them the bells above that do a dodge in three four five six then uh, there's a section of hunting where a bell leads and a bell lies and other bells Ross in this sort of area uh, and then it's repeated and there's more of these blocks of seconds so um, if you are thinking about sort of using grids and place notation to support your learning the way they can help is you can uh, start to look a bit at the grid and maybe at the place notation to support that and think um, okay so I'm seeing that there's a section of a bit of plain hunting and then there's some dodging and you always dodge when this particular thing happens uh, that sort of thing always dodge when seconds is made and so on and so it's a way of uh, starting to add some extra information to your picture of how the method works 
There are some ringers who ring almost entirely using either place notation or grids or, or method structure related stuff. Uh, that's quite hard and it's not necessarily something you'd, you'd want to do straight away, but it's uh, quite a useful thing to perhaps think about as a way of supplementing uh, your method learning. Um, just looking at a really simple grid, this is the grid for plain bog minor and the place notation. Um, cross and 1-6 is basically a section of plain hunting. And so because we've got just cross 1-6s all the time, that tells us, and we can see it in the grid, that bells are simply ringing lots of plain hunt. And that then when the treble's leading, there's one, two, there's seconds. That's the different bit of work, the dodging, uh, that happens at the, at the lead end when the treble's leading. So that's a, another, another grid, uh, another way of thinking about it for, for playing Bob. Um, just showing a few more uh, examples of use of grids. This is um, double Norwich, a really nice, really interesting and historic method, very musical, uh, but one that lots of people sometimes uh, have a tendency to get wrong because of a, a um, rather unhelpful rule-based system for ringing double Norwich. Um, but if we look at the grid, there's a very clear structure to it, which is that you can see hopefully these sort of almost look like boxes with leading and fourths here, thirds and sixths here, fifths and eighths here, and we can see that in the place notation, where the treble is hunting uh, through sort of one, two to, th to three, four, uh, and two bells are making places either side of it, and that's causing some dodging to happen here, uh, and then when there's places made here, you've got dodges either side there, and so on. Um, similarly, uh, this isn't to say you'd necessarily be about to ring Cambridge Royal, but there is a structure to Cambridge Royal as well, and similarly there are boxes sort of around where the treble is. There's a, a sort of rule for ringing Cambridge, which is that most bells dodge when the treble's hunting. There's a dodge here, and here's the hunting. And most bells hunt, ring plain hunt, when the treble dodges. And that actually applies all the way through the lead of the method. You can study this in your own time uh, and have a look at it if you want uh, later. Um, so just five quick sort of top tips on how to learn a method based on what we've talked about. Try to break it down into sections, learning a place bell at a time. Methods are usually symmetrical. Uh, there are occasional exceptions to this. Uh, so use that to help your learning, the fact that there's points of symmetry. Look for familiar sections from methods you've learned before. Have a look at the place notation or grid to see if there are any structural features which could help you to bring it. And um, finally, uh, try to test yourself or get someone else to test you to help embed your learning.